<laughs> Today's been an interesting day of hats. We've been going from one hat to another hat, describing and discussing how sometimes in life, God brings you into circumstances that he sets you in a different setting in a different place in order to accomplish a different purpose. Sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes that's not so good. To give you an example is that there was a time in America where the idea of divorce was foreign to Christians. They were probably heavily influenced by the Catholic Church that had a very strong tradition of not allowing divorce to occur within the church. And so many people grew up with a guilt over any type of concept of leaving your spouse, whether man or woman, and it was only a marriage between a man and a woman, so <laughs> we're not going to get into the whole homosexual issue, because that is a sin. But there was no real issue about there being a question of what divorce was or whether a person would stay in a marriage, because they did. That was expected of them. They were living in a different culture, it seemed as though that were the Christian idea. Today it's not so, is that Christianity has the highest divorce rate. It's even higher than secular. And that's sad to see because the reality of what people are doing is more of a treating marriage less than what God wanted it to be, that he had designed it to be a image, as it were, a picture of his love for the world and Jesus' love for the bride, for the church, for those people that were called unto himself, that it would be a union that would describe the unity that God has in the Father and the Son. And so there is in law that were shown that Moses, because of the hardness of men's hearts, according to what Jesus said, allowed there to be divorce and that it was never meant to be so from the beginning because if you joined yourself to a person, you were bound to them in some ways by your spirit, your soul was connected to them. And having experienced divorce, I know that that's true, that you are connected to that person in some ways. And that is a sad testimony of what life can do to you in the circumstances as they affect you, whether you're a Christian or whether you're a non-Christian. And so, likewise, you know, we're told in other areas of Scripture to not marry unbelievers, and yet every time you turn around, you find a Christian marrying a non-Christian, and they get them saved, you know, and somewhere down the line, they either get divorced or they stay together. But the person has to make a choice and a determination. Sadly, you know, I have seen the benefits of the pros and cons of all of that, and how God's grace can still extend to a person to forgive them, to encourage them, to exhort them to move on in life, whether married once or twice or more than that. And the tragedy of relationships is that's what man has done to himself as well as to what the Word of God declares. Somehow we've gotten less serious about it. And God wants the truth always to be known that irregardless of what you think you have done, God still holds you accountable to the wife of your youth. You shall stand before God and give an account for the marriage that you've had or have multiple times. And you'll either deal with it now and ask forgiveness for it and go through the process of healing and restoration, or you'll carry into relationships that burden of another person that really is still there influencing you in some way. We call it baggage in a lot of ways, but it's actually a spirit. There's kind of like a spiritual attachment that goes on. And unfortunately, the person isn't set free to be all that God wants them to be. So in all of that, in relationship to what God has done for us, God never said that he would leave us in our sin, no matter what we've done, but he would rather help us by way of teaching us to come to him when we fall, when we fail, when we 
find ourselves, as it were, in wrong relationships, bad relationships, or even in divorce, or in death, or in life, or if, God forbid that you've committed some serious act of either murder, killing, and in your mind by being angry or in reality. But all of these things you're meant to bring to God and to deal with in truth. That's kind of why I put this hat on is that when I was in uh, Massachusetts, <laughs> yes, I lived all over the place. <laughs> when I was in Massachusetts, they were filming a uh, special from Court TV. And it says, Court TV News, the whole truth. And one of the things that, you know, you do see in watching Court TV is you see a judge and you see a prosecutor and you see a defender and you see a jury and you see all this evidence that's presented. But you don't actually see truth because the person doesn't get up and say, I did it and this is what I did. They're always trying to prove that someone did it a certain way or somehow did this or did that and then the people have to decide. The fact for a Christian is that you can't hide from the truth. Who you are and what you are and what you've done is all evident before God. He was there and he knew before you were saved, while you were doing it, and after you were saved, what you've done. So truth is something you always need to bring to God and allow him to forgive you and to change you and to encourage you in some ways to not do the same stupidities that you may have done in the first place. The same sin that seems to easily beset you so that he can cause you to not drag your spirit, so to speak, into heaven with all these scars, but rather he can heal you of your emotional problems that have existed for a long time with you and that he can bring you to a place of complete salvation to make you perfect and acceptable in his eyes on the day that you were presented to him by Jesus himself. Because he's going to look at you, Jesus will, as a bride who is without spot and blemish. Even as we're going to look at Jesus as though he were not marred and he has no scars. He does. Because of the cost of what we've done, he will be marred forever. In Tozer, men are lost, but they are not abandoned. And unto Adam he said, Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. From Genesis 3.17. There is sound Bible reason to believe that nature itself, the brute creation, the earth, and even the astronomical universe, have all felt the shock of man's sin and have been adversely affected by it. When the Lord drove out the man from the eastward garden and placed their cherubim and a flaming sword to prevent his return, the disaster was beginning to mount. And human history is little more than a record of its development. It is not quite accurate to say that when our first parents fled from before the face of God, they became fugitives and vagabonds in the earth. Not really. And it is certainly not true to say that they passed from the love and care of the one who created them and against whom they had so deeply revolted. God never abandoned creatures made in his image. He did not abandon them, and he will not abandon you. Had they not sinned, he would have cared for them by his presence. Now he cares for them by his providence until a ransomed and regenerated people can look once more on his face. The corruption that has gone on from that initial act that God cursed the world and cursed man with death is a corruption that prevents us from seeing God obviously because if we could see him we would be destroyed by that corruption that we have in our flesh that we have in our body everyone knows that as you're born even though your body begins to grow in some ways your cellular damage begins to deteriorate in others because there is a corruption that's going on of your DNA and your RNA and of the nucleic acids and of the structure of the cell itself that begins to wear upon you, that your days will be numbered rather than to continue living because the body tries to heal itself always. It's trying to regenerate, to become new. The same way that plants try to restore themselves even though even as I look at my tree that's dying, 
even though they may not be able to do so, they will still try to live because there is that part of what God created in us that will always seek to live because it was created with life. But because of corruption that has happened in the world, we cannot see God, but we must have something that helps us to come into relationship with God, that allows us to come to a place of communication with God. And what that is, is what Jesus did for us. He has brought a means by which we can now communicate. And in that day that Jesus accepts us, when he says, come blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you, then we shall see that this corruption shall put on incorruption, and this mortality shall put on immortality, and we shall be made perfect in his eyes. Until then, we aren't, and we never shall be. There is not a human being living today that is perfect. There never will be. It can't be, because they were born in corruption, they will die in corruption, and in corruption they will continue to exist. But because God will put incorruption upon us like a robe, then we shall be made righteous. Then are lost, but not abandoned. That is what the scriptures teach, and that is what the church is commissioned to declare. In times of extraordinary crisis, ordinary measures will not suffice. The world lives in such a time of crisis, as it is today. Christians alone are in a position to rescue the perishing. We do not settle down to try to live as if things were normal or set back and act as though it's okay to do what we're doing and get away with it. No, nothing is normal while sin and lust and death roam the world. As long as there is corruption in the world, then we who are being made perfect by that incorruption that we'll see that has been placed within us must share that hope that lies within us, that confidence that we have by Jesus Christ's atoning sacrifice made for us so that we can give to others the solution, the vaccination, the remedy that will cause them to no longer have that sickness, that stain, that corruption, that cancer that's in their life that will kill them one day, eternally for their soul, forever for their spirit, and most sadly, completely annihilate their flesh. So for us, the truth is, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Whether you've been in one marriage, ten marriages, whatever, whether you've, you know, committed murder in your heart or murder in your hands, whether you've done done your time and paid your crime, or whether you're suffering the consequences of your actions, God himself for eternity can forgive you. God can bring to you salvation. The point being, you may still suffer the consequence of your actions because this corruption will not put on incorruption until it perishes and is no longer remaining on this earth. In the form of the rapture, we are not necessarily taking this flesh with us, but we are caught up into the air so that we would be changed in the twinkling of an eye so that we could be with the Lord, that he would be our savior, violently tearing us from the clutches of this world, as it were, to be with him in incorruption, that we would no longer have that sinful nature, that we would be removed from it and become that perfection that God intended all of creation to be. So that one day we shall see a new heaven and a new earth, that these plants will no longer be under the curse that we will discover that God never left us nor forsook us, though he could not tolerate imperfection in his presence. He allowed a means by which we could discover salvation and come to a place of relationship with him so that in the end, love would have been shown not just from the beginning with Adam, but all the way to the end with Jesus. That from the beginning until the end, his plan of salvation was accomplished even so we failed miserably in what we were wanting, caring, and created to do, and what we could not do of our own ability. But now we know that the dependency that we have comes in that perfect relationship with God himself. You have that. 
incorruptible seed in you, if you have the Holy Spirit, then take that and let it germinate as you read the Word. Let it blossom as you are watering it by the Word of God as you hear it spoken and by the fellowship of love as you go to churches or to Bible studies or to fellowships or to people that you know and are encouraged by the love of God shed abroad in our hearts so that it could produce a fruit that you would be not just an image of God, but that you would be Jesus to someone today, that they too could discover there is a way, there is one way to know God today. And that is in Jesus.